And we are live. Good morning, everyone. Morning, depending on where you are, probably afternoon where you are right now. Uh, this is the first time I've, I'm actually running an Ask Me Anything session. By the way, my name is Edwin Sarmiento. I'm a Microsoft Certified Master for SQL Server. Um, and um, you've probably seen some of my articles on MS SQL Tips, uh, videos on YouTube, um, you know, some of the presentations that I've done in the past. And this is actually the first time I'm doing a, uh, a uh, you know, an AMA session like this. This is kind of like an, an experiment for me. And uh, I was supposed to initially do this on GoToMeeting until uh, we've had some major technical glitches on, on my GoToMeeting account yesterday where we were in the room, people could not come in. And, uh, you know, at I think about some time my audio cut off and we were all kicked out. And so I decided I'm just going to put this on uh, StreamYard and let it stream across uh, the different platforms. Um, I'm, I'm thinking possibly in the future, I might do this um, once a week or bi-weekly, depends, um, depends on the schedule. But again, it's kind of like one of those experiments where you have to try it out first and see if it works. And if it does, you keep doing it. But I'm getting uh, questions. Of course, if you're on uh, either on LinkedIn, on Twitter, or on YouTube, I'm, I'm believe, I believe this uh, streaming on YouTube. Say hi. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I can read uh, your comments on the, on the chat portion of this. But uh, I've worked with I've worked with always on availability groups uh, since 2011. This was way in the uh, you know early days um, prior to getting it out in production, meaning before Microsoft released it to the general public. And I've seen um, uh, a variety of not just questions, but cases. And uh, it's interesting because when, when people ask questions about always-on availability groups and the underlying platform that makes always-on availability groups possible, kind of get a sense of where they are at, uh, meaning what their experience is, what their background is. And um, this is an opportunity to share some of the learnings that I've had with you, plus some of the questions that people uh, ask. And uh, again, it's interesting reading some of the questions um, uh, that came in. And uh, hopefully, again, in the future, uh, I may decide possibly in, in 2022, uh, possibly do this twice a month, may, maybe a bi-weekly kind of thing. So let's get started. Uh, this is SQL Server Always On Availability Groups. Ask me anything where I ask people to submit questions uh, through a form and I will answer them live. And when we talk about Always On Availability Groups, um, we're talking about not just the feature, the SQL Server feature itself, but also we're looking at available clustering, the underlying platform that makes Always on availability groups, highly available. So let's get on with the uh, questions. Oh, I'm, I'm seeing uh, I'm seeing comments in there. Hi. Uh, first, uh, first question that I have. And by the way, I, I I try to use the banners feature on StreamYard and see if I can compress the questions because people would give you uh, uh, a, like a, a a story of all the uh, settings that, and i totally appreciate that because again when you're dealing with complex architectures like an always on availability group there really is a lot to consider but uh the banners portion only allows 200 characters so i'm trying to um as much as i can compress the question to make it meaningful when i show them on here so that you can read them plus um give a little bit of a background based on the question they submitted so let's get on with the first one First question, um, I can't remember who uh, submitted this. What is the best approach for applying Windows patches to your AG environment? Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll focus on the first sentence there because the second sentence, uh, you know, our AG environment is equal to 2016 standard edition. Um, it's interesting because when you start to think about it, what is the one thing that will probably never go away? Well. There are a few. What, what is one of those things that will never go away regardless of, um, regardless of whether you're running uh, your SQL Server databases on premises or on the cloud using um, uh, VMs? It's patching, right? I remember the time when uh, 
you have to patch all of your servers at certain dates of the month like patch Tuesdays, we call them patch Tuesdays because that's basically when Microsoft would release those patches. And uh, nobody wants to be doing patch Tuesdays because Tuesdays are not supposed to be the time when you are bouncing your servers or restarting your servers. You're supposed to be doing them after office hours. And of course, nobody wants to be working after office hours. Uh, nobody wants to be uh, doing on call, unless of course you don't have a life. But uh, going on to this, what is the best approach for applying Windows patches? Availability groups and anything that runs on top of a failover cluster makes patching a little bit more scary. Okay, a little bit more scary. And I say scary because there's a reason why you put your databases in an AG. And there's a reason why you put your AG on a failover cluster is because you want high availability. Okay, the sim there is no simple answer here because it really depends on uh, the complexity of your architecture, um, the uh, uh, the uh, amount of people on your team, right? The uh, skill set of your team. While in the past, especially with standalone SQL Server instances in Windows, standalone Windows servers, um, all we did, don't laugh, all we did was to download Windows patches and SQL Server patches and configure your windows to install them automatically and reboot whenever possible. <laughs> that was the thing. And then people complained, hey, how come I got disconnected from my uh, application? How come my server is offline? Well, you told the server to, uh, to install the patches by the time they download it and then uh, restart automatically, right? And when you're dealing with an availability group, or anything that involves high availability. And again, I'm talking about failover clustering, uh, running resources on top of it, like availability groups, is you really have to think about um, preventing outages, right? So this is not just as simple as I'm gonna install the Windows patches, I'm going to reboot the machine, and that's it, okay? This is a long, um, a long process that people don't think about. In fact, um, I tell people all the time, treat installing patches and you know with, with sql server uh, cumulative updates like it's an upgrade project what do you mean by upgrade project well you have to have a uh, change management plan you have to have a, a process in place where you need to back up and if things go south you have a rollback plan right why do you need a rollback plan because there isn't a perfect uh, uh, service pack. There isn't a perfect cumulative update. So you need to properly test whether or not this is uh, going to screw up your environment, right? So it's more than just installing the security patches. It's more than just updating your servers or your uh, uh, SQL servers. You treat that as a project, an upgrade project. And you, I know you might be thinking, wait a second, if I am going to treat this as an upgrade project, then we're not going to be able to uh, do this every month because we don't have the resources. And you're right. And that's why you also have to uh, consider that as part of your uh, resource planning. And I know I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on this because this is something that you will always do if you want your ser uh, SQL Server databases and your Windows machines to be uh, secured uh, with the Microsoft patches that they're releasing. So rule of thumb, with a high availability solution like an availability group, start with a secondary first. Start with a secondary first, okay? And then install the patches, reboot, and then move on to the, uh, the primary and then failover prior to that. But keep in mind that when you do a failover, it is an outage. When you do a failover to your secondary, it is an outage. Your databases will be um, uh, will be recovered on your secondary. The client applications will get disconnected, and so it is an outage. Now, I did mention earlier that this is not a simple thing where you just install the patches because I know people take it lightly. Install the patches on the secondary reboot. What a lot of people don't realize, which <clears throat> come, uh, which uh, uh, ties into the second question that I'm going to talk about. What most people don't realize is the fact that a simple patching process can cause an outage 
much longer than when you're just failing over your AG from your primary to your secondary replica. Why is that? If the sysadmin taking, and here's the thing though, um, Windows patches may be released more frequently than SQL Server patches. So your Windows sysadmin will just treat that machine just like anything. You know, the, the usual stuff. They would install the patches, reboot, and that's it. If that sysadmin is not aware of the other things that involve uh, in, in, in making always-on availability groups highly available, then it may cause a ton of issues. And I, I say this because I, I think I've worked with like dozens of cases in the past uh, regarding this. One thing that uh, comes to mind was uh, I was involved. It is failed of a clustering. We were patching servers uh, back when I was still a data center engineer. Um, we were patching servers, and this is a two node failure cluster running SQL Server, patch the secondary, right? Patch the secondary, and then uh, in the process, move uh, the, uh, the, I call it, a cluster resource group because it could be a failure of a clustered instance it could be an availability group move that over to the secondary but then i realized well, wait a second five min five minutes in it's not coming online what is wrong with this and of course i was the one responsible for uh, uh doing the failover installing patches what i did not realize that one of the sysadmins patched the domain controllers and we had like three domain controllers uh, for backups and standby. They patched all of the main controllers at the same time. Yes, not something that you would do, but again, we're not aware that they're doing that. We have a patch management process and we have a maintenance window in place. They did that. And then when I, <laughs> the thing is your failover cluster talks to your active directory for authentication and then realizing that there's no active directory domain controller to authenticate to what could you know what could possibly uh, allow the failover cluster to come online if it didn't have any domain controllers available and so again it may sim it may look like a simple patching process oh, I've, I've done this a ton of times you know what could possibly go wrong and this is one of those things where um, we think nothing's going to happen because we know you know we've been doing it for quite a while but now that you have failover clustering in the picture running availability groups on top of it and you're simply installing windows patches mind you we're not even talking about sql server here uh, he he was asking about applying windows patches but because sql server runs on top of a windows server failover cluster while you're applying that windows patch and somebody else is also doing something in their network if you don't properly uh, coordinate these activities, it becomes a little bit more problematic. That's just one case. The other case was, this was in the early days of uh, always on availability groups. Um, we, I had this customer uh, uh, deploy a uh, two node failover cluster with a two replica AG. And uh, I noticed when I was building the AG, that there were some events in the Windows event log telling me that there's something wrong with the file share and they were using a file share as a witness. You know, I told them that, I said, hey, you gotta fix this before it starts causing issues. And uh, I said, yeah, we'll fix it. You know, it's highly available file share, we'll fix it. But, uh, you know, a couple of days later, I still see those events in the Windows event log and I kept sending emails. Two weeks later after deployment, I get an email from the customer and just to paint a picture, this was a database for a SharePoint farm. The entire farm went offline. Well, the fact that your databases are not available, well, that causes a bit of an issue with your, uh, with your no, I'm not talking to you guys, uh, about you guys. Uh, they lost their entire farm because they lost the databases. And this is, it's, it's interesting because we were back and forth in email and I was asking, uh, so what happened? One of their sysadmins installed a security update on Windows. And just like what I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the rule of thumb here is to start with installing updates on standby. Be it SQL Server, be it Windows, start with installing the updates on standby. They 
install the updates on the standby and they see this prompt only uh the changes will take effect with you uh reboot the machine and guess what he did he rebooted the secondary now i know you might be thinking wait a second uh what could possibly go wrong he just rebooted the secondary here's the thing what he wasn't aware of is the fact that the witness you know I, I, I did mention in emails that there were some issues with the file share witness. I, the, the network connectivity between the cluster and the file share witness was intermittent. And so they were getting some issues. And lo and behold, the minute that he rebooted the secondary replica, I mean, the server that's running the secondary replica after installing the Windows updates, the entire failover cluster went offline, causing the entire SharePoint farm to come offline. And they were not happy with my response. I said, that's by design. Yes, it is by design because, and, and again, I'm trying to simplify this as much as I can because I, I have a, a, a dedicated section uh, in my training classes on just quorum alone and the concept of quorum. And again, they were not happy with my response because I said, that's by design. I'm like, what? Yeah, uh, you have three voting members, two nodes in a failover cluster and one file share witness. You lose two because technically the file share is gone. I told you to fix it first, but you kept telling me you're going to fix it. So you're now down by one voting member. So that's two out of three. And then you reboot the secondary. So you're gone two out of three voting members. You're, you're left with one voting member. That's not majority. And again, I... They're not happy with my response. I say it's by design, even though there was nothing wrong with the primary, even though the databases are healthy, even though SQL Server is not even feeling any uh, performance issue, uh, uh, application related uh, issues, nothing. It was healthy. It was fine. It was working properly. But the fact that uh, the cluster lost quorum, it, it had to protect itself from anything. And so it took itself offline. They didn't, uh, they noticed that the SQL Server instance is up and running. Well, yeah, because the SQL Server instance is not in the availability group. And so when you look at your monitoring, they just show that the thing is up and running, but the databases are offline. So again, it, I, I took some time to really answer this question because while most sysadmins, and keep in mind, this is Windows patches. In large uh, uh, organizations where you have segregation of duties and the DBAs are not taking care of the uh, operating system where there is an IT team, a sysadmin team taking care of the uh, Windows uh, environment, if they're not aware of what is going on on the database side, if they're not aware that this is a cluster, if they're not aware that this is running mission-critical, highly available databases, they might just think... Uh, there's no harm. I'm just rebooting the secondary. Is that what the documentation say? They would do that and cause more problems, not realizing it's by design. Okay. So again, don't treat your patching exercises lightly. Okay. Do not treat your patching exercises lightly. And again, the second statement, the second sentence there says our AG environment is equal server. It doesn't really matter. Standard enterprise. There is no uh, addition specifically for figuring out that somebody else did something and you were not told about it. Okay. Uh, and I'm also reading some of the questions. Uh, uh, Rauf was saying, interesting, where was that file share located initially? The file share was on a highly available file share. It just so happened that uh, it's not connected properly to the network, meaning, uh, I think there were some routing issues with their uh, routers where um, the network guys were. Uh, we're uh, testing some firewall rules because it's a it's a regulated environment. And the thing about this is, again, when people do stuff simple, I mean, how complex is installing a Windows patch? You do it all. Well, I'm on my Mac. I <laughs> I don't do this here. You you install Windows patches on a regular basis on your Windows 10 machine. Uh, you do it on your servers. No harm done, unless of course the patch totally screws everything up, which now requires a rollback plan. That's why I uh, started off in the first place. Treat your patching process as if it was an upgrade project, especially for high availability systems. Okay, um, So that's that. 
oh yeah, I got a ton of horror stories and war stories about the simple exercise of patching. And I'm not even talking about, hey, what about an eight node failover cluster with um, four AGs and an eight replica uh, availability? I'm not even talking about that because that's completely ridiculous when it comes to uh, not just installing the patches. The installing part is easy. It's the dealing with the people that you have to talk to, right? You have to coordinate, hey, when's the best time? And the, let's say you have, uh, I had a client where they have an eight replica AG, no, not actually eight. They have a eight node failover cluster with a four AG. So uh, four of the nodes are running uh, one AG each, they have four nodes that are running secondary replicas of those primary replicas. And just coordinating with the stakeholders, when is the perfect time? Because one department does not agree with the other department and it's crazy, right? The doing part is easy. It's the people coordination. That sucks. Uh, Mahmoud was asking, what do you think applying always on over contained databases for SQL Server. I rarely see contained databases in the field. Um, a little bit of a backstory, and I know I'm going off track here with my questions because I'm seeing questions coming in from LinkedIn. Um, contained databases were initially designed to help people move to Azure SQL DB. You know what it is with uh, logins having uh, mapped user accounts or users in a database. And when you're moving databases across different servers, you you end up having orphan database users. And so what, what that was originally designed for was if you want to move from on-premises to Azure, Azure SQL DB, that is not Azure VMs, is contained databases. But I have not seen a, a ton of those in the field, mainly because it's the same, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's the same challenge, right? Um, and so uh, whether you put them on top of an always on availability or not, it's really not about uh, the, the challenge of that. And uh, while most people, and the way I think about this is while most people look at a technology feature, like for instance, oh, how do we solve this? While most people look at that, I try to look for process improvements because there's no amount of technological feature that would solve a broken process, right? And so that's, again, just, my take on it. Okay, I'll, I'll move on to the next question. Uh, ah, I love this process. How do you keep SQL Server agent jobs in sync between replicas? I love automation. Um, if you've seen uh, uh, some of my articles on MS SQL tips, a lot of them leverage PowerShell. I'm a PowerShell guy. I love automation in place. But there's one thing I hate about people who do automation is that they don't think about the process first. Because, again, it's a good segue to this. If you don't think about a process first, automation can just make things a lot worse for you much faster. That's why I have notes. I, ha I write down the process in place so that when I do the automation, I'll just pick up the portions of the, auto uh, of the process and put that into automation. Which leads me to answering this question. How do you keep SQL Server agent jobs in sync between replicas? There are a couple of ways. You can use SSIS uh, copy uh, SQL Server agent jobs task. There's uh, DBA tools. Hopefully you're using DBA tools as a DBA. Uh, you have those to script out and recreate the uh, SQL Server agent jobs. But again, one of the reasons I, uh, I, I don't recommend automation lightly, even though I love automation, is the fact that when you start telling people, hey, use this tool, then all of a sudden they start to roll out the script across multiple servers. Now, dozens of servers are problematic because of that one script. Um, is to, instead of automating this, create a process first that is embedded in your change management process, right? How does it work? Do your developers just create jobs on SQL Server? Uh, do they create this with standalone instances? Uh, what about for SQL Server instances that are in an availability group? How do they do it? Again, a lot of these things we don't really want to talk about as technical professionals because that's sort of business analyst. Right. But again, it makes life a lot easy if you start off with the process. In fact, one of the things uh, alongside with this is how do you replicate SQL Server logins? Because 
you know, every SQL Server instance is is, is its own uh, SQL Server instance, which means your logins when you create them on your primary replica, they don't automatically get replicated on your secondary replica. Besides, your master database isn't on your availability. So uh, there's a ton of of references out there. Where, yeah, I just create an automation thing. I don't automate anything that has something to do with security where I need to really take a look at what is going on. And again, the process is more important than automation because your process will evolve the automation piece. You know, put in a tool, it works, right? I don't automate creating logins because I've been bitten by this a ton of times in the past where somebody would create a login with sysadmin privileges. Of course, nobody does that. Your applications don't get sysadmin privileges, right? So uh, somebody would create a login on one instance. They would automate that across. And then when a the time comes when they would remove um, the, the uh, uh, login on primary, they don't automate the process of removing it. And so when audit comes, uh, I would start looking at logins where it has more than enough privileges, like sys again, sysadmin. Nobody uses sysadmin, right? And uh, they would have that account on other SQL Server instances, but not on primary. And again, there is no substitute for a better, improved process. Automation just makes that easy. Okay, I'm looking at some of the comments on uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, question here is: What if you have Kubernetes, if you are running SQL Server on Kubernetes with always on availability groups, the question is why? I'm just curious though, why? Uh, I wrote an entire book on running SQL Server on uh, Docker containers. And the one thing that I always ask people is why? Why do you want to do this in the first place? Okay, uh, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And this is where I would step back a bit and ask questions, which actually leads me to the other question. Um, what, uh, I mean, why? Uh, do you have people who know how to deal with this? Do you know, uh, do you have the resources to deal with this? Uh, are you keeping tabs on the changes? Because again, when you're dealing with DevOps, in general, right? You have to keep track of everything that's happening because the last thing you want is for your developers to be doing something that your sysadmins are not aware of and your sysadmins are doing something that your DBA is not aware of. And here's the thing though, with availability groups, I always tell DBAs, your job is now dependent on the things that you're not even aware are dependent on, which means your promotion, your job is now at risk when somebody screws up. And you know how we make fun of the acronym DBA, the default blame acceptors, right? Something wrong with the data, with something, the applications, it's a database problem and the DBA gets blamed for it. Um, so yeah, that's my take on keeping a SQL Server agent jobs. Uh, there's an SSIS uh, task, the copy agent jobs uh, uh, task there. You can use DBA tools for this, but again, the tools are secondary. The process is more important. Another question here. I should have uh, added the names. What is the best way to configure a quorum for various types of use cases requiring cluster to span different data centers? You know, it's interesting when, when, when I uh, get questions like this. The best way, there is no best way other than the one that you deem what is best for you. I was listening to a podcast yesterday about um, uh, United States general, and uh, they were talking about uh, how did one general made a quick decision given the limited information possible. And the general said, well, you guys have been deliberating on this for six months and you haven't done anything. Whether my decision is right or not, at least we know immediately, <laughs> rather than spend the next six months deliberating on what we do next. Um, in, in action here is the key. So the best way is really not the question. The real question is, what do you currently need right now? And how do you address that need? Okay, Because I've seen multiple uh, environments where they have different quorum configuration. And the one thing that I, I also see uh, most uh, DBAs and sysadmins is that they think quorum is a configuration setting. They think quorum is a technical thing. No, it's not. Quorum is a concept. 
quorum is a concept and the configuration is what makes the concept possible. I'll tie it back to the story that I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the guy who rebooted the, the, the secondary replica, not knowing that the file share witness was gone and then it took down. And quorum is simply the concept of achieving majority of votes, like in a democratic country. When you have a, uh, somebody's running for office and he, he needs majority of votes to win. If he doesn't get majority of votes, he doesn't win. That's that. In a cluster resource manager, whether it's Windows or Pacemaker for Linux or any other third party, um, third party uh, cluster resource manager, <clears throat> excuse me, the cluster needs to achieve majority of votes. That's all it is in order to keep itself offline. Again, I'll tie this back to the story I mentioned earlier. The reason why the cluster went offline was because it didn't get majority of votes. At any given point in time that the cluster does not have majority of votes, it will take itself offline. Self-preservation, you know, uh, he wants to get healthy. He doesn't want to be infected by all types of diseases, so it has to keep itself offline. Split second could happen. And in that split second, if the cluster does not have quorum, AKA, if the cluster does not have majority of votes, it will take itself offline. The configuration, whether it's node majority, node in disk, node in file share, uh, uh, I'm not even gonna talk about the other one, uh, cloud witness, all of these are just ways to achieve quorum. So you're adding an extra vote. You're adding another voting member. And this is what allows the cluster to achieve majority of votes, AKA quorum. So when you're asking what is the best way to configure quorum, I don't really know because number one, I don't know your environment. Are you stretching your clusters? Because here it says stretching your clusters across different data centers. Why do you stretch clusters across different data centers? I'm just curious though, why? Is it because that's what the Microsoft documentation tells you? Is it because that what that's what most people are telling you? That's one blog post, one article, one YouTube video is telling you? The way I approach this is what do you need at this moment? What do you need right now? And it all starts with asking the recovery point, recovery time and service level agreement conversation. Because this is again, um, I was just referring to a client that I worked with that had an eight node cluster stretched across two data centers, AKA that data center's Azure. And the first question I asked was, why? Well, that's what the sysadmin that did this, uh, that, that uh, prior did to have this. Okay, so why? And they started telling me about their recovery time and recovery point objective as far as DR is concerned, because you have to be clear about the difference between your recovery point, recovery time objectives for local HA and your recovery point and recovery time objectives for DR. Those are two different things, right? You may have a, uh, a one or two minute recovery point, recovery time objective for local HA, but I can guarantee you one minute, two minute, recovery point, recovery time objective for DR, that's crazy. You gotta be at the level of AWS and Azure and, and Google to achieve that. But for DR, man, that is very expensive. And so I'm even asking the question, why are you stretching your clusters? Don't get me wrong, I've dealt with a ton of these in the past, but I always ask the question, why? Why do you stretch your cluster across different data centers? Is, is it because of requirement or is it because of what you, you, you've seen? Because I've also seen cases where they have availability groups on, uh, on premises and they would have other DR strategy for Azure or for uh, another data center. It could be log shipping. Hey, we can still do log shipping. So, some people are using third party tools, but before you even pick the technology, and this is one of the reasons why I don't really focus on the technology aspect first. The technology is just secondary. If you could address the real need, then uh, why? This is also one of the reasons why, you know, when SQL Server 2016 came out with distributed availability groups, you know, if you're already willing to spend that much amount, and because imagine how much, how much you're paying for licensing just to get that uh, availability group on a DR alone, and you're not even using it, 
of course, when you talk about the licensing benefits for SQL Server 2019 or the software assurance benefits, sure you can, but then I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier. Do you have people on the team that understands the impact of losing network connectivity between data centers? Do you have people in place that can be called on, aka be on call 24 seven? Of course, I don't expect you to be on call 24 seven, but somebody who would uh, fill in, you know, follow the clock, um, follow the sun uh, system where if they're on call, can they fix a problem caused by a network disconnection between those data centers? Okay, so again, even before you start asking the question of quorum, you really ha have to start thinking about, is this what we really need right now? Uh, do we really need a stretch cluster? Because a lot of people are still using stretch clusters because that's what Microsoft introduced back in Windows Server 2008. And people are doing that because, you know, it's in the documentation, might as well do it. Okay, but again, you can use log shipping, stuff like log shipping uh, to copy transaction log backups to uh, your secondary data center. It still works. Again, that's one, one of the reasons why you have to start with your recovery point, recovery time, and your SLAs, and then the process in place. I've seen people who have stretch clusters, and when they have to invoke DR, nobody knows how to do it. Okay, so the best way is really to start asking the question, what do we really need right now? Because the quorum conversation is, you know, uh, really dependent on the choices that you've already made. So let's say you decided, hey, I want to do clusters that span two different data centers. Where would you want to put the witness? Because I know you might be asking, so where would you want to put the witness? Do we put it on the third data center? Well, why would you want to put that on a third data center? Because you want to do automatic failover across data centers? Why would you want to do that? Uh, are your applications configured to do automatic failover? Because here's what I have seen, and you can prove this. Go on your smartphone and look uh, and open your favorite app. When your app does not respond, you you tell yourself, oh, it's a networking problem, or it's a database problem, oh, it's, some, it's an authenticate. No, you don't. You just say it's offline. So even if your database is failed over to your secondary data center because you put your witness on a third data center, how sure are you that the other things outside of SQL Server have been replicated? How sure are you that the applications were designed in a way that allows automatic failover and that everything works, right? <laughs> because it, it doesn't matter if you're the best database, database administrator in the world, you can fail over everything quick, fast, you've done your job, you're sitting at your table drinking coffee, but if your applications cannot connect to it because your applications were not designed for automatic failure, chances are it's still offline. Just not the database, but the infrastructure, right? So that's why, again, um, the quorum conversation is not even the main question here. Oh, what about, uh, what about, uh, you know, cross subnet delay, cross. -up. There's there's a lot of things to configure, right? But the really important question is, what do you really need right now that requires you to have stretch clusters across different data centers? Next question, and I find this really interesting. Uh, this is the question that came in through the form. Um, why is redo be blocked while running a backup on the secondary replica? I shrunked the log file on the primary database while doing this. Um, just to give you a bit of a context on the question, uh, I'll, it, it took me quite a while to shrink, literally use the word shrink there, uh, to fit, yeah, that's the right word, fit the question in the, um, the banner portion of StreamYard. So the question was, I have a database on the secondary replica, I initiate a full backup with copy only, uh, which is going to take five hours. Okay. While the backup on the secondary is being taken, I shrunk the log file on a primary database. Okay. After that, redo thread on secondary replica becomes blocked by a backup operation with wait type lck underscore m underscore u. I want to understand why redo thread is being blocked here. Why? Well, for one, um, and I know I'm, I'm sounding a little bit uh, overdramatic there. Why are you shrinking the log file 
while something else is going on in your secondary. Now, I know what you're thinking, yes, it, this is an emergency, emergency thing. Uh, you may need it, but the way I interpret this, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, is I shrunk, which means it was intentional that he was shrinking the log file while the backup's running on the secondary. Now, the lock type, the, the, yeah, the lock, L-C-K-M-U, is a lock typically encountered on uh, on objects in the database. But what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, these locks can happen internally as well. And these are um, designed uh, in the beginning when I when I when I heard transaction, I thought it was just for user objects, you know, tables, store procedure, we have locks. But then SQL Server maintains its own internal system for tracking what's going on. So when you're shrinking the log file, that is in and of itself a transaction. It's an internal transaction that SQL Server tracks. Okay, And when SQL Server does that, it's locking something. right? For instance, I'll give you a ton of internal uh, SQL Server activities that are implicit, not explicit transactions, but we don't see it because it's happening under the covers. When you increase your database a uh, uh, file, whether it's your database file or your log file, when you increase that, that's a transaction. How do you roll back a transaction when you want to increase the size? Well, you can't really, because you already asked the, the storage engine to ask the, the storage subsystem for that space. Similarly, when you're shrinking a log or file in general, Right, a, a uh, whether it's a ba database file or a log file, that is a transaction, and SQL Server has to wait until that transaction is complete internally, internally, before transaction before the logs are released. And so, um, while you're doing that, the secondary replica is already running redo. Right, you're running a backup, and um, uh, I I can't remember if I have this on one of my YouTube videos where I talk about how the backup process works, where it takes a look at the, uh, the it marks the beginning of the backup, and it starts reading the database while the backup's running. And go, of course, there are still transactions going on under the covers. Why? Uh, and by the time it reaches the end of the database file, where it re reads the full database backup, it goes back to the beginning and it looks at all the transaction log records. Now, the transaction log records are not just log records generated because you run, ran a DDL statement, a DML statement, rather DML statement. It also includes transactions when you run a, DML, a DDL statement, rather, like that shrink file. And that's part of that. And you, you, your backups on a secondary is keeping track of that. Right? That's why it's being blocked. And again, the, the question that I actually had in mind, why? Why try to shrink the log file while there's something going on on the secondary? And if it's an emergency, that's fine. And this is also, again, it's also one of the reasons why you really need to understand what is going on under the covers to prevent these types of things. The way I look at it, just don't do it. Plain and simple. Uh, uh, oh, I was saying, I. I, Ralph, it's your question. Uh, I did just for experimental purposes. Yes, it is for, I do a lot of stuff for experimental purposes, like breaking uh, availability groups on in my lab, just so I don't do it in a production environment. Yes, just, uh, I, uh, this reminds me of the time that I had, uh, I had a, uh, a process in place that overwrote an entire SQL Server machine. And I'm not talking about database. I'm talking about machine, where I created a Windows XP image, and that image got deployed to a production SQL Server machine. Yes, that's uh, how crazy it can become. Uh, what else? Oh, this is another fine one. We are just starting a migration upgrade project from SQL Server 2012 to SQL Server 2017. And implementing AG for HA and DR setup. We have no experience with AG. Where do we start? I remember the very first time um, uh, Brent Ozar and I had uh, the you know, ran the SQL Server always on availability training class back in 2017. And it's interesting because it was not expected that I'll break my leg, my right leg. 
and uh, throughout the training class, I was sitting and he was kind enough to do uh, 10 minute breaks every 15 minutes or so. And during those 10 minutes, I would lie down, lift my leg, put, an, uh, put a pil pillow underneath it because it starts to, it started to swell. And a swollen leg is not the best feeling at all because now you feel all sorts of pain all, uh, all over your body. Um, and I made it through three days, but at the end of the third day, I was so exhausted just because my leg was swollen. Why am I telling you this story? Would I be very confident to go in the emergency room, the operating room, when the doctor would tell me, hey, I'm your doctor, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be Asian here. Uh, hey, I'm, yeah, the Asian doctors in North America, because that's exactly what every Asian parents would want you to be. Um, I was talking, uh, how would I feel if the doctor came in and said, oh, by the way, this is my first time doing this, and I have no clue, I'm an intern, I've never done this. Like, what are you? I'm not even going to do, do that. The thing is, I've seen so many cases like this where people are thrown into something. We need to build an availability group. I remember one client of mine, uh, he was the youngest person that went through my training program and he was an Oracle DBA. Mind you, he was a smart Oracle DBA, doesn't know uh, anything about SQL Server other than the basics. And the first thing that his manager asked him to do was build a distributed availability group with available clustered instances as replicas across countries. Yeah, across countries. And just the mere fact of thinking about it made him freak out. Yes. Is, uh, that's one of the reasons he reached out to me and I said, don't. Don't. Why? It's just like saying you're going to do your very first brain surgery and you haven't and all you did was watch a bunch of uh, uh, Grey's Anatomy episodes. Don't. Okay. Part of that is really preparation and this is where you really have to learn and know how to push back. Think of it this way. I, I keep using the uh, uh, surgery analogy because that was very uh, uh, appropriate when I did the, the very first training class back in 2017. Uh, it is scary to know that there are a lot of DBAs out there who were thrown into not just managing, but building, right? The managing part is very common because an ISV came in, a managed services provider came in, a consultant came in and built this massively complex architecture that nobody knows about. And then the DBA that does not have any clue about AGs, uh, he's getting thrown in and uh, being told to do this, right? Uh, push back. It's for your own safety. It's for your own sanity. It's for your own health. The last thing you want is to be thinking, and because the guy was really smart, but he was freaked out. And for weeks, he couldn't sleep just thinking about this. Okay. So if you are planning on doing an AG implementation, both for HA and DR, and you have no idea about doing it, one, say no. Because your job is going to be on the line. Number two, just because you know how to do it doesn't mean you should. Because if that's a mission critical database, and I keep emphasizing the recovery point and recovery time objective uh, uh, parameters here, if that's a mission critical database and you're on vacation and you're the only person, and you have spotty internet connection, you have spotty cell phone signal, and you're right in the middle of nowhere because you, you are supposed to be on it, and it goes offline, it's gonna be your fault because you went on vacation. And of course, it's not supposed to be your fault because you're entitled to a vacation. And this is the thing that I tell people is that don't just think about you being able to do it. And this is exactly what I tell my customers even. If you are thinking about it and you don't have the right team, you don't have the right um, uh, technical expertise. I, this, I, I remember when um, 
SQL Server 2017 was released and the ability to deploy SQL Server always on available groups on Linux, uh, one of my clients reached out to me and said, hey, we read your article on MSQL tips and you know, deploying SQL Server 2017 availability groups on Linux. Can you help us with that? And I started asking questions about it and they told me, we have Linux people. Everything in our environment is Linux other than Active Directory and SQL Server, but everything else is Linux. So we're okay with that. And I only asked one question. Well, two questions, actually. Uh, the first question was, do you have anybody on your team who understands availability groups? Well, at that point, there was only one person. He's deployed it in his lab. Eh, good enough. So one person, and, and they have a very tight SLAs. And the second question I asked was, does anybody on your team, and I mean not just the DBA team, but everybody else, because he kept bragging about how all of the staff, how all of the engineers have uh, Linux expertise. And I said, do you have anybody on your team know, who knows Pacemaker like the back of their hands? That was more than enough for me to tell them, stop, don't. Because the last thing you want is for you to be the only person who knows about this. And the last thing you want is for you to be on vacation and they're calling you and you're getting fired because you're not answering phone calls. Stop, right? Um, push back. And just because I'm an, uh, I, I ex uh, specialize in availability groups doesn't mean I recommend availability groups slightly. No, I don't. I don't. I prevent people from doing it unless they really need it. Okay? So get uh, competent people on the team, not just you. In fact, with AGs, you need a minimum of two. Two people. You and a backup. Right? You don't want to be on call 24-7. Trust me. It's not fun. Uh, you need somebody as a backup before you can implement something like this. You start with having that conversation with your manager. And if they're really uh, they're persistent about it, get you trained on it, get you uh, a lab environment where you can start working on this and invest. Otherwise, don't. And I don't even want to uh, uh, rely on managed services provider or a consultant bringing this to you and deploying it because when they leave, they leave. It's all on you, right? Um, and I say that as a consultant because uh, I don't. E the last thing I want is for me to deploy something and the people who are left taking care of it don't know how to deal with it. That's why I try to keep uh, uh, my implementations and design as simple as I possibly can. Uh, what else? This is probably gonna be the last one. There we are. No, come on, show. There we are. So what is the best cluster setting for failover and for node? And a lot of these things, um, uh, questions that pertain to configuration. And it's interesting because when you start reading documentation out there uh, and blog posts and YouTube videos and articles and even courses, they'll show you the how. The how is easy. Anybody can do the how if they know how to read the documentation. The how is easy. The why is very difficult to answer. That's how I always ask the why questions. In fact, people get annoyed when I ask what I call the five whys. I want to do this. Why? Oh, because of this. Why? Oh, it's the why. And when they get annoyed, because it helps them get really clear about what the problem they're trying to solve. This is an example of this. What is the best cl cluster settings uh, for failover and for node and file share majority? Um, I don't know. How many nodes do you have? How many uh, replicas do you have? Um, are, what version of Windows do you have? What version of SQL Server do you have? And why do you why do you want this in the first place? Why do you want this? Because how to make sure that the failover to an alternate data center? Again, another question here that says, how do you make sure that the failover to an alternate data center happens? You can't because you cannot control the minds of other people unless you get them to agree. Yes. Talk about one of the reasons why I don't really like automatic failover between data centers is because no, it's not because of the technology. The technology, it's easy when you think about the tech. Well, not really. It's complex. But if the applications are not designed to handle automatic failover across data centers, then you're sitting there with your databases working, yet the applications can connect to it because they're not designed to handle automatic failover. 
and so there's no point. You have to look at this from a bigger picture. Um, there was one time that I worked on a, a client a couple of years ago where they wanted to have a failover across data centers. And by data center, they mean Azure. Uh, they have an on-premise database. They are they're, or not. Oh, yeah. Um, and they have that. And they've tested it. Uh, they have uh, resources on Azure. And they want to test the automatic failover. Everything was working fine. After uh, cutting over to production, and they invoked the failover, they realized that the query, or rather the application, was so slow. Yeah, it, 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 they, it's not something that they expected. And so they had to, uh, uh, they had to revert back to on-premises. And what they recognized was the fact that the, automa the, the failover whether it's manual, automatic, really doesn't matter. The failover to their secondary data center was flawless. The reason why, that, why the application was so slow was because the application was still on-premises and it's connecting to the databases on Azure. And the network latency between two was what caused the application to run really slow. And that's, again, one of the reasons why uh, the emphasis more on having everybody involved in coming up with a strategy like this. And just the fact that you want to get everybody involved is a huge thing, right? Because when you start to think about, hey, how do we make sure that failover to an alternate data center happens? So what if you guarantee that the failover to an alternate data center happens for the database, that is? But what about the application? If the application doesn't work like you did your database, it's totally useless. You just spend a ton of time, money, and resources trying to do all of these things. At the end of the day, you're still the DA, the default blame. Yeah, the application was slow because it was a database problem. They kept, kept blaming the database, not realizing, oh, the application couldn't was not designed to fail over to uh, the cloud. And so it's one of those things that you really have to consider before you start thinking about how and the what, you start the question with why. And your recovery point, recovery time objectives, and your service level agreements. That's about it for this. I, I do have a couple more, but um, a lot of these uh, questions are more design. And it's very challenging to come up with design, uh, rather answers, quick 30-second answer or a, a one, two-sentence answer for a design question. because. This, this, here's the thing, design is one of those things that we as technical professionals don't really want to do because it doesn't get us to do work, right? When you're on uh, the usual pen and paper and you start uh, uh, mapping out the things that you need to do, it doesn't, it's not as, as exciting. However, designing, uh, yeah, designing is the key to making sure that what you're putting out there is not something that would cause you a ton of headaches in the future. Yes, we'd love to uh, play around with really nice technology. But the thing is, the, re the reality is, if you're the only person who knows how to do this, you're going to get tired, you're going to get burnt out. And next thing you know is you're going to quit IT altogether and you don't want to do this anymore. No, take good care of yourself. <laughs> That's kind of like my, the, the last thing I want to talk about. And if you want to know more about, because uh, I kept mentioning the always on available group uh, training that I've done way back when. Here's a link to it. Uh, and uh, make sure that uh, uh, watch the feeds, whether it's on YouTube, on LinkedIn, or on Twitter. Uh, watch it because I probably after Christmas, because it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Uh, after Christmas 2022, uh, beginning of the year, I'll probably start doing this on a bi-weekly basis. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button whether it's on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or YouTube, so that you get notified when uh, I do do these. And I can't really go anywhere at this point, so I might as well just keep myself productive while I'm doing this. Enjoy the rest of your day while I start making preparations for... Uh, oh, um, we are actually hosting... Let me just pull up my, uh, my calendar real quick. We are doing the Microsoft Data Platform Business Continuity Group Open q and If you have other questions that pertain to uh, business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, I'm going to be there as a panel as well. As well. Uh, look it up on Meetup. Yes, look it up on Meetup. The name, why don't I uh, post 
this in the uh, banner section so that you are aware of this. The uh, uh, Microsoft Ed Platform Business Continuity Group on Meetup. We're, we're going to be doing that. I think it's uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central. Uh, 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 you know, if you have other questions, fire away. We're, uh, not just me, but all uh, the other people in the community will be there to answer your questions. And again, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you again the next time I do this. If you want to get notified, uh, hit the subscribe button. I will be posting the form in the future so that you can submit your questions beforehand so that I can put them on this nice thingy uh, where you have a banner, click it, and it appears for everybody to see. All right? Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you again the next time.